is Philip Martin, and uh, this is on film, on video, uh, October 15th, 2021. Howdy is barking. I don't know why. I don't know if you can pick that up, but anyway, I have a dog barking. And, um, well, you just can't deal with that right now. Uh, what to talk about? Well, the thing I really want to talk about is the... Um, Ongoing Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival. We went down last weekend and had a really marvelous, you know, time down there. Uh, the the highlight of the um, of the festival for me so far, and I'm going to go back and probably watch just about everything because they're doing it virtually, which works really well for me because I can go to the gym and I can dial up a documentary. And while I'm on the treadmill or whatever, I can watch it there. So that that works really well for me. I can carry it around with me. I can multitask that way. Um, I think I prefer the old way where we didn't have to worry about this stupid virus and we could all just go pile into a theater together and see it. But as an alternative, this is a really <laughs> reasonable uh, way to consume a movie, I think. I mean, it's just like, you know, um, I can watch it when I have time to watch it, and that's what we've been doing. Um, the highlight of the f of the festival so far has been, um, and I can't imagine I will see a better documentary this year, maybe not a better film than, um, is it Michael Heinemann? I think it's Michael Heinemann's um, the, the First Wave which is a movie about the uh, early days of the COVID-19 crisis in New York City. Actually, it's uh, in, this is set in Queens at the Long Island um, Jewish Hospital, which is, in, even though it says Long Island Jewish Hospital, it's in Queens, New York, and it's quite a big hospital, apparently. And this is the one, if you will remember, I saw some footage of this, uh, it seems to me like this was the exact same footage that I see in the movie, see in the film, where they had the tractor trailer uh, morgues out behind it. This was a, a place that was really on the front lines of the uh, first wave of the um, COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, and New York City was the hardest hit place in the world for a while. It starts in March 2020 and goes through June 2020 when there is actually some, and it ends on a note that's, that we all know because we are all here living in October uh, 2021. We know this stuff is not over, but it, it does end on a slightly optimistic note. Uh, oh boy, it's a harrowing film, and it will make you mad. It'll make you, it'll make you want to shake certain people. Maybe you have an uncle <laughs> or a sister or somebody who is still uh, convinced that this is, you know, all hype and it was all just sort of, it wasn't that big a deal. It was just a, like a slightly more virulent strain of the flu or something. But uh, it's a tough movie to watch. It's really hard to watch. After we finished the film we went into the little VIP area they have backstage at the film festival to get a bottle of water and you know a snack and we went in there and a woman came in there who had been in the screening with us and we were already talking to the people who the, the nice volunteers who were manning this uh, this room we were already talking to to them about the film and telling them how harrowing it was well hello that's my barker. Hi, Audi. Come here. I need an Audi right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Audi, you've been outside. You've got a sticky head. Okay. So we're talking about the movie when the woman comes in. And the volunteers say, well, what did you think? And she just looked at them with this blank, devastated look on her face and said have to process this and you do you have to process this I mean it's not I'm you know I'm you could criticize the movie on a number of levels I mean it's sort of um, 
it's right there in the emergency room. You are right there in ICU. You see these people who are dying. You see these people die. And it's tough. And I think a lot of us need to see that stuff. I mean, I do. I think that, uh, I'll, you know, I think there are people that need to see, that need to experience this viscerally because they've been in a position where they have not experienced it vis viscerally and they have not had anybody they know who's come down with this virus and who's had a serious case of COVID. But you see that here. And on the other hand, I will say that I have in total sympathy with people who think that's a hard thing to watch and maybe they don't need to watch it and maybe they can skip it. I'm glad I didn't skip it. I mean, this is the sort of thing that, you know, sort of like, I'm. it's, it's gory. I mean, it's gory in a real way. I mean, it's sort of like, this you are always aware that this is a very real movie there is a wonderful shot in it i don't know how they well it's it's luck i mean it's luck and it's anticipation and it's being able to use your tools right but you know it's it's not all luck but there's a wonderful shot uh, a very brutal shot when you know the george floyd um protests are going on and the police get into it with some protesters and it comes from over a building and it looks down on them and it looks like a tableau from a Brian De Palma or Martin Scorsese film that's going undergoing that's taking place underneath this camera but it's not it's real it's real action it's 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 no one is paying attention to the drone and nobody is acting in this and that makes it really powerful it really you know, sort of underscores, you know, uh, the horrificness of this whole situation because you get a, a peek into the, dyna the dynamic between, you know, the healthcare system and the justice system, and you start to understand why, if you didn't understand before, why some people are so angry about the way this country <laughs> purports to take care of its citizens. There's a doctor who's just amazing in this and it's she's amazing because she doesn't know exactly what this is. She's fighting at first and the, the film really takes you from the point where COVID is, is almost a rumor. She says, well, there were three patients last week that we identified with it. Now every one of them has it. And you see people loading bodies into body bags and taking those body bags and stacking them in these tractor trailer cooler uh, units, in these portable temporary morgues. You see the mass grave. It is frightening, it's harrowing, and it needs to be shown on those news channels that would never show it. <laughs> you know, it needs to be, if you have someone who is a denier or a would-be debunker who wants to do their own research about this stuff, well, they need to see this. Unfortunately, there's no way to make them see anything. <laughs> and this was a, a film that didn't get into a lot of uh, film festivals. Didn't get into Sundance. It didn't get into Telluride. Didn't get into Cannes. Didn't get into the New York Film Festival or Toronto International Film Festival. Um, Hot Springs, I think, was the second film festival after the Hamptons um, International Film Festival to show it in this country. Uh, it is going to probably get a you know, pretty wide release, or at least somehow, because it's a Nat Geo underwritten thing, and Alex Gibney's the executive producer, and, you know, so it's a big documentary. For the way these things go, this is a fairly, uh, fairly big deal. Um, I'm also looking forward to, you know, The Rescue is actually opening this week, another Nat Geo documentary that's just amazing. <laughs> that is just, yeah. and the reason it's amazing is because they've got 87 hours 
of footage from the Thai military who released it to them about this rescue that uh, you can read the review. I mean, I'm not going to recount everything that's in that review and all that, but the Thai military cooperated with them and gave them all this footage, and that's why they, you know, um, were able to get some of the images they get. And uh, another one that's coming out, and I think this, I think the rescue is coming out this week, and I think, um, uh, well, I don't know, I, I don't know when um, um, the first wave's coming. But the other one is the Cousteau movie, Cousteau, uh, which was kicked off this festival, and uh, that's coming out, I think, in November. So, um, and I haven't watched that one yet, but I've got it on my iPad. So I'm going to watch it, so, which is, you know, again, if you don't have time to do this, this is the virtual uh, screening thing is really great. The Hot Springs. I hope they kind of keep it up. It was something that film festivals did a little bit of. I remember Tribeca used to have this video library kind of thing where you could uh, get the movies, you know, and watch them in your hotel room if you didn't have time to go see every screening. And often things are programmed against one another. And if you have a specific movie you want to see sometimes you know you just can't get to it because well for us we don't stay for the whole festival anymore we go for three at the outside four days yeah. i'm going back to hot springs this weekend i think so that will be you know we spend four days there so and that's about typical when we go to a to a to a festival you know we don't we're not there for the whole thing. So if they do have an option like this, it's really good because you can pick and choose. I, like I said, I probably can't watch all 35 features. I think there's 35 features at this year's festival, which is way down because of the pandemic and the you know and they have they have the mask and social distancing rules in place. So you know um, they can't have a full fledged uh, festival like they normally do like they have had in years past so there's are really great options really really good way to do it so anyway the other thing i was going to tell you, well halloween kills opens this week and we didn't get a scratch we did but the screenings we the screeners we got came in on thursday so that's too late for the newspaper but Again, and we're evolving, and, and those of you who, the few of you who actually attended these videos uh, have been kind of in on this all along, that we're, we're evolving and we're not so much worried in getting things in on the day they open anymore. Now we're willing to, like, wait a week and uh, see how it goes, you know, and I run the review the next week. Sometimes, you know, we mess up. I mean, I, I really wanted to get a Sopranos review in last week. But we didn't get it in, uh, and so I told um, Keith Garlington to go ahead and put it on his website and in his in his because you know I mean I, maybe I could have got it online, but uh, you know it's it, we're, we're still working this stuff out. We still don't know how we're going to deal with movies that we don't immediately see. I am still trying to free myself from the need to review virtually everything um there's too much stuff and we're already not reviewing a lot of things that open in um in streaming services and stuff like that so um we do what we can and <laughs> and we always have a full section so that much is that much is okay um there was something else i was going to talk about talk about the film festival Talked. Oh, the last duel. I want to see the last duel. I want to see this Affleck um, Damon project. Uh, they had some help writing this one, and it sounds like a very interesting film. And Dan Leibarger um, liked it quite a lot, and he wrote he wrote our review of it. And that was another one we had trouble getting, you know, a screener for. And finally, Dan actually had a screening. In Kansas City, which is why we're running that. I think we're going to have Keith Garlington come back next week and give his take on it, because it may be one of the best films of the year. I, again, I have not seen it. I'm working from a, a place of relative ignorance at this point, but it looks fascinating, and 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 it sounds fascinating. And Dan says it's better than even the trailers indicate. So that's one to look at. Um, 
that the rescue uh, lamb is opening lamb is I love Icelandic movies there was a time when I really think I could have uh, put forth myself as a world expert on Icelandic film because I pretty much had seen them all <laughs> that's they've outpaced me now I mean there's plenty of Icelandic uh, films I haven't seen and there has been some bad ones that we've seen and remarked upon and uh, so I'm not anywhere close to the top of the <laughs> Icelandic film experts anymore but I do really like them and, and this one uh, has a little bit of that Robert Eggers The Witch kind of feel to it it's a takes off on a um, an old folk tale and it takes it to you know pretty literal um, pretty literal links I mean I think that a lot of people see this I see the trailer or see even the photos from it and go what the heck? but I'm willing you know I mean there's been a lot of Icelandic films have been really great the film came out a couple of years ago Rams I really like that um, I'm not a horror fan. I don't think this is actually a horror movie, though some people seem to believe it is. Um, <laughs> I think that the marketing is sort of not quite on point on this one. But we'll see. What else is opening? Okay. Oh, Hard Luck uh, Love Song, which the only reason I'm going to mention this, Courtney um, Lanning uh, wrote a review of it. And it's based on a Todd Snyder song. And I did not know about this film until Courtney told me she was reviewing it. And, and I looked around, and sure enough, there it is. It's coming out, and it's going to play theatrically. Uh, I don't know if it's playing theatrically in this part of the state, in the central part. I think it's playing in Northwest. Maybe it'll be picked up here. And anyway, it won't be too long before you can see it um, on your devices. So it's worth yeah, I mean, and Dodd Snyder has been on my mind because last week he had one of those unfortunate things in, in Las Vegas where he, the crowd was rude and he walked off the stage. And I certainly understand that <laughs> being someone who has, on occasion, you know, performed my own songs uh, to crowds, uh, it's really difficult to do that if the people did not come to see you. Ostensibly, these people came to see. <laughs> Todd Snyder, hear him play his songs, and then they talk to it and, you know, ruin the experience for a lot of people. So, anyway. Uh, and Snyder is one of my um, favorite people to see live. He's just a real... I wish somebody would do a movie about Todd. Uh, it seems to me that he's been around for 30 years because I do remember seeing him in the late 80s uh, I've heard other people say, well, he's been touring for 20 years. Well, no, he's been touring for almost, for more than 30, I think. I really believe that. It seems like he's, you know, I've seen him, you know, six, seven, eight times. And usually in a club with just very few people. And he's a remarkable entertainer and a very good songwriter. Uh, but he's one of those guys that, you know, has never broken through quite Though I don't think anybody breaks through anymore unless you are, you know, one of these uh, corporately anointed uh, entities. And that's no knock on them. I mean, but you have to, it's sort of like being a baseball player. If you're 24 years old and you're still in the minor leagues, sorry, son. <laughs> you're a, you know, lifelong minor leaguer, more than likely. Um, and that's kind of the way the music business is. And the music business is more about image and attitude and the crafting of songs by the song shops in Norway and Sweden that then it is about any sort of you know musicianship or songwriting and I'm not complaining I'm just kind of explaining that's the way the big stuff is there's plenty of room and plenty of ways that you can you know make a modest living being a singer-songwriter, and even, you know, someone like Jane, Jason Isbell sort of proves the point that you can still have a career that's based in producing an album every couple of years and touring behind that album. Um, <clears throat> but it's not the same as it was in the 70s, the 80s, even the early 90s. You know, the, the grunge era sort of was the last gasp 
of um, that album driven you know thing I, and, and there's plenty of old people plenty of baby boomers who still buy albums and still pay attention to it that way but that's not the main thing anymore I mean sort of like uh, if you take judicial notice of the fact that video games are bigger than sports and music combined bigger than the mus- than the movie industry and music combined then we probably all ought to be paying a whole lot more attention to video games um, I don't because I don't know anything about them I'm not terribly interested in them you know that sort of thing and I have a niche where I'm fairly privileged and I get to you know spout off on stuff I do think I know about like 70s movies <laughs> we're continuing our our movie night which is it's just fantastic i really don't know why we didn't do this sooner but you know it's like every um every week usually saturday or sunday night depending on whether we've got something going on or not you know usually one of those nights we have something going on so the next night we'll do it you know uh, we'll, we will take a movie that uh, an old movie and we'll watch it again. We'll rewatch it. Usually, usually I've seen them, but they were a long time ago. Like we just watched uh, from 1978, an unmarried woman, um, Paul Marzuski's uh, Jill Clayburgh. And, and and the funny thing is, is you notice a couple things about this when you rewatch a movie that uh, you haven't seen for well since it came out so for so more than more than 40 years. So I'm watching this movie and. It hits me in two different ways. And number one, it's there's a certain hokiness that just attaches to anything that, that that's 40 years old. I mean, it's just sort of like things don't land exactly right the way they might have to a contemporary audience. But the other thing and the more important thing that really strikes me is how damn honest this thing is and how um, well realized it is and how brave this Clayburgh character is, Erica, who's being who's left by her husband, Martin Murphy, and it probably ruined his career because he became a heel. <laughs> every, every, that's the only thing I ever think of Martin Murphy as, is he's the heel in an unmarried woman. And, you know, Cliff Gorman's in it, who's a wonderful male chauvinist character in this. And, I mean, again, it, some of it comes across as over-the-top and hokey. On the other hand, you know... There's a scene in it where she goes to her doctor and she's talking to her doctor about, you know, basically about how she feels. She's being left and she feels lonely and she feels bereft and she feels bad. And the doctor, you know, presents at first as a sympathetic character. And he listens to her and he's talking to her and he says that well maybe she should get out maybe she should you know see some people and you know if she wants to maybe she should have dinner with him tonight and I thought about that and I said man it's like in the in the moment I went no that would never happen no doctor would ever do that my wife Karen's sitting there next to me going oh yeah they would sure they would male doctor sure and that's sort of like okay that's the perspective. <laughs> the perspective you gain from uh, watching someone else's work of the imagination. Um, an Unmarried Woman. Uh, recommend it. It's not in the same league as some of the other things we've, we've rewatched, like Friends of Eddie Coyle and uh, all that. But it's still, it's still one that um, is worth digging out. And there's a Criterion Collection edition of it. Uh, and I think I said this. I talked about scenes from *Marriage to Jessica Chastain*. I think I talked about it for two weeks in a row, so I'm not going to belabor that. But I've got a copy of the. I got. I didn't know I had it. I've got a copy of the original. I said I was going to order it, but I actually have it. Yeah, I dug through all my uh, old films, which there's probably close to 500 now. I gave a bunch away. I mean, more than I kept. But I still probably have 500, and uh, I found it in there, so we're going to watch that pretty soon. We're going to watch the TV series, which I have not seen. I've only seen the theatrical release of it. So we're going to watch the Bergman, the original Bergman, 
and um, maybe we'll watch that in time for Bergman Island, which I hope will come here next week because we're going to have two reviews of it. Anyway, that's it for this week. Um, I think I went a little long. All right. Well, they'll deal with it. We'll have to upload this manually. Okay, guys. Thanks so much. Bye. (laughs) Thank you.